Welcome, good morning. Happy New Year. <clears throat> Often we're starting a new series at this time, but we're continuing in a series. And uh, if you looked at the worship schedule, this isn't the end. I added one more. But today we're talking about being the voice and that Happy New Year reminder. Happy New Year. Like, may it be happy. Don't we need some happy? It is time for a lot of happy in Happy New Year. May we be blessed to be a blessing as we commit to serving Christ, commit to serving the congregation, commit to serving our community and our communities because we represent several communities in Jesus' name as a local body. We pray for God's guidance. We pray for God's blessings through the year as we do his will because we want to bring him glory. May God be blessed with the growth of his kingdom within us and numerically. We want to do what God wants us to do. And uh, may it be a wonderful new year as we do that together. Again, differently than we have in the past. We have people in the building. We have people online. Don't you look forward to being together? Let's pray for that and continue to work towards that. As we're getting started with this week's content, what are the parts of the body that we've talked about so far in the series? So we need ears, we need eyes, hands, and heart. What are we talking about today? Let me hear from you. Well, I heard a few of them. Is everyone's voice the same? To the point that you can do voice recognition. It's called the mass singer. <laughs> How well do you do with that? You know the voice, but you can't see the person. And then they reveal themselves. Oh, I, I know that was... How well do you do when you hear the voice, but you don't see the person? Because in a way, that's what we're asking the, the lost, the unsaved, those that don't know Jesus. We're asking them to hear the voice through the church, but they don't see the person of Jesus. They see congregations. We're asking them to connect in a way that when they make that connection, oh, it makes sense. But unlike the other parts of the body, we are not the voice of Jesus. All we can do is emulate the voice of Jesus. We don't want to copy it. We don't want to tell people that the church is Jesus and that everything we say is right because only he can give us the true message. Only Jesus is right all of the time. Our voice is unique. Let's use the word low. Can you make a low sound? Low. Let's hear it. Low. High sound. Hi. Hi. You have a range in your voice. It's important. Do you know where your voice comes from? You feel it when you're talking. Your voice comes from right there, that vocal fold. <clears throat> it's kind of like this. We've played with these before, right? This is how to be annoying. So you got air that's going to move through this little section. What happens when you stretch that out? You can, what happens when the air just goes full? What happens when you want to be annoying? That's for the people on the... Can, put that over there. That's how our vocal cords work. They tighten and that changes the tone of our voice. And they loosen, that changes the tone of our voice. It's the air moving through it. So all of that's got to work in order to have our voice work properly. We're not talking about necessarily just the vocal part. We're talking about what did Jesus talk about? So that asks us, when you speak to people, 
what do you often talk about? Isn't it amazing we have Scripture? That we have the Gospels in particular. We can read of these conversations that Jesus had with people. The, the record of them has stood. But then we think, if we're to be the voice of Jesus, what do we talk about? What's the content of our speech? When Jesus spoke to people, what did he often talk about? And how do you think he talked to people? What do you think it would have been like to actually visit with him face to face? To be around the campfire at night? To be there when he's doing his major teachings? To be able to go aside with him and say, I heard that you were saying this, but what did you mean? What a privilege to have to been there, to have heard, to know his voice. So much that they could hear his voice in the garden. Could hear his voice on the water. They could connect to the voice of Jesus. We've had this little song, Be careful, little eyes, heart, ears, hands, mouth. What you... And what's the reason why we need to be careful what our body is doing? Because the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful what you're doing. How that impacts people. How that draws people either closer to God or sometimes farther away from God, which we don't want. But we need to be careful how we are living if we are to be representing the body, being the body of Jesus. It's a significant importance. So we're nearing the end of the holiday time after celebrating Jesus coming in the flesh through Christmas and celebrating New Year's Day as the end of 2021 and the start of 2022. Last year when we started 2021, did you know what was ahead? No. No. We didn't know that they, of the continued impact of COVID-19 pandemic. We didn't know of a record-breaking heat wave. We didn't know that there would be evacuation for the first time of forest fires. We didn't know how all of these things were going to impact our personal lives, our families, how it was going to impact our congregation. We didn't know that it was the last year that we would have with Ella or Austin starting a new life, a new commitment, and Ashley being baptized. We didn't know what was ahead. What we knew was that God was going to be with us through any of it and all of it. We know that God is at work, don't we? We know that it doesn't change. God is always at work, and we want to join him in that work by doing the work that he's doing. We want to do it by his power, and we want to do it for his glory. We want to do it to the best of our abilities. The series, as we know, has been about being the body of Jesus. Our purpose is to follow Jesus as his disciples. We are to work at emulating the characteristics. I want us to think of if he did this with his body, then how do we do that as his body today? Each day and each choice brings us deeper into an amazing transformation of being more like Jesus. Today we're going to look at four aspects of the speech, Jesus' speech. What did he do? How did he do it? Jesus' speech was helpful to people, wasn't it? Can we say that ours always is? Jesus spoke to draw attention to sin. How often do we do this? Jesus' speech was grounded in the word. Is that true in our life? Do we speak his word? Because we live his word. We know his word. And Jesus' speech was controlled. Would other people say the same of us? He knew what to say, how to say it, when to say it, and how about this, and when not to say it. Because of his connection to the Father. So we're going to look at each of these and an example of each through the Gospels. A lot of this is going to come from Matthew because Mum said Matthew's the best anyways. Jesus' speech was helpful to people, but one we're going to go to in John, in John 4, 4 through 26. Do you know where you're at? Do you mind flipping through your pages? What's the account in John 4, 4 through 26? I got a hint there, there's water. Jesus speaks to the Samaritan woman. You see where we're going? He speaks to the Samaritan woman. 
Don't jump past that. He speaks to a woman from Samaria. We know that that's a challenge because Jews don't get along with Samaritans. Jews, especially Jewish males, were taught not to value Jewish women or women at all. They were considered inferior in God to God or in his plan. It was, and so for Jesus to speak to a Samaritan is already an issue. For him to speak to a woman is another issue. But yet, it's his speech. What did he say What's this conversation about? And isn't it amazing that we have that conversation recorded? So when we read the account, oh, by the way, what time of day was she at the well? Mid-afternoon, in the heat of the day. Is that when you usually go to the well? No. Why do you go to the well often at mid-afternoon? Because no one else is there. Jesus shows up at the right time, the right place to have this one conversation. A significant conversation that changes her life and her influence in the society. In verse 9 it says, The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then it says, For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So that leads to a spiritual discussion that has confession about her marital and living status and questions about what God really expects from people in worship, the discussion ends with a certain point. I know that the Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. In verse 26, then Jesus declared, the first time in John when Jesus says who he is, I who speak to you am he. I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us, and, and he says, I who speak to you am he. The conversation changed her life and the lives of those around her. He knew what she needed to hear, and they soon got to the heart of the matter. As the body of Christ, we need to bring people to Jesus through the good news, which changes their lives and changes our lives. Because God has had this conversation with us. I know what you need. I know how to help you. Let's have that conversation. Jesus was helpful. Part of that, even in this account, is that he drew attention to sin. What's in the way? What is harming you? What's impeding your life? the sins that were causing damage. He did this with the woman at the well in her living status and showing that God's view of marriage isn't the cultural view. It's a message that needs to be taught today as we help people make the change. He most often drew attention to sin when he exposed the sin of the Pharisees. That's who gets most of his correction. But he also helped his followers know what God expects of them. So in Matthew 5, 21 and 22, the whole Sermon on the Mount shows Jesus defining sins as he intended and he, how it is through the sacrificial covenant with Jesus as the king and this is the king in the kingdom. All through the sermon, Jesus teaches about sin. He clarifies sin for the people of the kingdom because the common, the cultural, the, even the common religious definitions fell short just as they do today. So Jesus has to identify what is causing harm here. Let's look at one short section about speech that can be confusing. In this section on speech, 5, 21, and 22. This isn't the whole section. It's about murder, but it says, You have also heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. That's true. That's definitely in the Old Testament law. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. One of the difficulties in, as Dick was saying about the covenant and the old the covenant under the Levitical promise is that it focused so much on behavior that as long as you don't do the murder, you can think and feel whatever you want. But as long as it doesn't take you to murder, as he says the same thing, well, as long as it's not adultery, you can lust. Well, no. It's about the intent that goes beyond that, the reason that you're there. Anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And again, anyone who says to his brother, Rack is answerable to the Sanhedrin, but anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. 
Well, this can be a bit confusing. If you look at your notes in your Bible under that, under the word raka, it's probably going to say an Aramaic term of content. You fool. Even worse, we'd think raka, that's the one we don't know. But it's, it's when you look at somebody and you say, in judgment, I don't need you, I don't value you, I don't want you. So the contempt, raka, like get away from me, that type of a statement. But you fool is about judging the moral value of people. You are of no value to me or to others. Everyone is valuable to God, and we're to not to judge. The problem in this section, as in most of the Sermon on the Mount, is that it is about dehumanizing, about removing the individualism, the fact that Jesus would love that person even if I don't get along with them. Dehumanizing leads to objectification and treating people as disposable instead of valuable. So it starts in the mind, how you view and value people before it comes out in a changed heart, in changed speech. Because it matters how you view people and relate to them, you have to do right by others and settle matters quickly. Jesus let people know what God expected of them. We need to help correct people's inaccurate view of sin as well as help them change. Just pointing out sin doesn't necessarily help people change. Jesus makes the difference. It's what's the damage in it? Why, why does God want us to live and look and think differently? Well, because of the damage that it causes. Getting to the root of the issue. Jesus' speech was helpful. And there are times like this where it's, be, it's helpful because it draws attention to, here's the harm that you're allowing in your life through sin. A third aspect of Jesus' speech was that we need to emulate is that his speech was grounded in God's word. His speech was helpful, it dealt with sin, and it was grounded in God's word. Matthew records seven times where Jesus says it is written. In this one, Matthew 3, 16 through 4, 11, about the temptation, one of the great examples of Jesus' use of the word. Once Jesus is baptized and begins his ministry, he is tempted by the devil, the accuser. Jesus uses the Bible, uses scripture in context, because they don't have a Bible, but scripture in context to defeat Satan and the temptation. Is that our pattern for defeating temptation? We do know that the accuser then uses scripture against Jesus, so we need to know scripture in context as applied by the Holy Spirit. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Because Jesus used scripture in context appropriately as applied by the Holy Spirit. The devil uses scripture out of context for selfishness. We need to put the word of God in our hearts and our heads so that we can speak the truth. To speak the truth of God's word naturally and accurately. If his word is active in our thinking, it will become active in our speech. Reading and learning the word makes a big difference in your speech. So this year we can make a commitment to learn God's word by studying it together in classes and in our Zoom studies. But we have a way to connect to God's word to incorporate it into our lives. So the fourth aspect of Jesus' speech that we're going to look at today is focused on emulating that his speech was helpful, it drew attention to sin, it's grounded in the word, and that his speech was always controlled. Jesus knew what to say, when to say it, how to say it, and often, at times, when not to say it. Back to Matthew. In Matthew 9, 1 through 8, records Jesus choosing his words very carefully and actually being challenged by, you said it this way. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to a town. Some men brought to him a paralytic laying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, the fellow, This fellow is blaspheming. So the first words that Jesus says is, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus say, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, 
or to say, get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, get up, take up your mat and go home. The man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to men. In a way, it was easy for Jesus to say your sins are forgiven because nobody could see the result of that. You can claim that somebody's changed, but there's no evidence. To tell him, get up and take up your mat to a paralytic, that means a change. Jesus says you're looking for the wrong type of change. When I say your sins are forgiven, he is changed. Whether he gets off the mat or not. But I'll also do that so that one proves the other. If that's what you need. Jesus knew to do them in the opposite order that they wanted in order to draw a point to why he was doing what he was doing. Jesus knew when to challenge people and when to let it go. He knew when to speak up. He knew when to defend himself and how to get to the heart of the matter. The last few hours of his life show a great control of his speech, does it not? The very few words that Jesus says, and we've looked at the seven words from the cross in particular, he did not defend himself. He agreed with Pilate. And he spoke to the Father and his followers. There are very few times that Jesus speaks during that whole section, and every time is significant. The Bible has a lot to say about speech. It's an area of life that we can always be working on. James 3, 1 through 12 is a section that you may want to look through this week. There are numerous proverbs, of course, which talk about the power and the poison of the tongue. But today, the passage I want to conclude with is here from Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 29 through 5, 4. It's a transformational text. It's been a key point in our Zoom study. I hope it impacts you as we see the need to speak as Christ would speak, to what not to do and what to do, the changes. Sir, so there's some absolutes because we've had three chapters of theology, right? That's our, for our Zoom study people. This doesn't come out of nowhere. We've already had three chapters of who God is and what he has done. This is the call to action. But he says, do not let, what's that next little blue word there? Any. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Not that way, the old life, but this way, the new life. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Here's your action. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice, sins that impact relationships. But replace them. Verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and as a sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place. And what replaces all of those, but rather thanksgiving. Because of our connection to Christ, we are changed. We are changed from the inside out. We have died to self. We are living for him. So how do we make this change in speech as we want to be the body of Christ individually and as a group? Matthew 12, 34, ends with, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. It's the love for God. It's the care for people. It's the realizing that we represent Christ individually and as a group that we need to be aware of what we say and how we say it. Jesus had an identifiable voice. People around us are looking for, listening for some guidance. Are we able to guide them in a way by calling them to listen to Jesus? What can you, what can we do to make our speech patterns more helpful to others? Good questions to think of. What would we need to change? What would, do we need to continue? How do we be more helpful in our speech? How can you, how can we draw attention to the damage of sin while showing love to the sinner? 
where we don't lower the standard, but we help realize that people aren't there. Neither are we, but we want to encourage lifting one another up to the standard, loving one another without lowering the standard that this sin causes damage. How can you, how can our reading of the word become more a part of our speech? How can we encourage that in Bible classes or in discussion before and after? How can we develop speech patterns that are connected to the Word of God? Where do we have that opportunity to talk about God's Word? How can you grow in controlling your tongue and using it for the benefit of others? There's even a problem in this question. You're not going to control your tongue. God is. You surrender your heart and God controls your tongue. What's one change that you can start today? And maybe it's realizing that you don't have the freedom to just say whatever you think and that everything has a consequence. Not to limit us in our speech, but to realize the importance of being presenting God's Word. But there's the relevance of why. It's not just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, make a change. If we just speak differently, it'll change everything. But it's the why. The change comes from the heart. We make our change. Why we make our change is very relevant to God and to the work of the kingdom. What we want is to be the body. And that means being his body in speech. To carry his voice. To show others. To call others. To hear his voice. He is the shepherd. We are the sheep. Listen to him. Even God said... He is my son. Listen to him. And that's what we call one another to. So that was supposed to be the end of the series, but I got thinking. And I thought, well, we've only had one active, specific. I mean, our voice is active as well. Our hands reach out. But how many passages are about the feet? About the call to go? Not just stand passages, but go passages. As we are the body of Christ, we are also called to go. And let's think about that next week.